New York, Chicago, Boston. Oh, Boston, there's only one. Hi there, Coach Sage Candy of VO2 Max Productions here with another training talk. Today we're going to talk about the Boston Marathon and kind of the idea of improving your marathon time to basically meet a, a time goal uh, is essentially what it comes down to uh, at a pretty high level. And uh, you know, I was reflecting on Boston, they gave me this nice certificate in the mail, uh, I was real happy. Uh, with how my race at Boston went this year. I've done it a couple times and this year went a lot better than the first time. It's probably my best career marathon to date, uh, even though the time doesn't reflect that because we kind of had crappy weather. But that's part of the game. Uh, that's part of the idea of, you know, focusing on certain marathon races or, or half marathon races to improve your performance, improve your personal best, and to move closer to maybe a long-term goal. And for a lot of people, Boston is a, an ultimate goal in marathon running uh, for people all over the world because of its rich history. Uh, you've got over 118 years of, of race history, uh, the, the people of Boston, the unique point-to-point -point course, uh, and then finishing in downtown. It's a really special uh, event. And then it's exclusivity. Uh, it's an exclusive event because you have to qualify to, to get in, uh, at least most people do, and there are time standards, and there, there are time standards that people, you really have to push yourself to meet, I think, for the the hardest one is is um, men in the 18, I believe it's 18 to 29 year old age category. It's 18 to something. Young men, uh, that's the most hard, the, the fastest time standard. I think it's a 305, but you usually need to get under that standard uh, to even get entry. So 302, I think, got in for next year, but a lot of people, you might as well go for sub three hours uh, if you're in that time range. Whereas uh, for women, it's a little bit different. And, and as you get older, it's kind of age graded on, on up. So if you're a guy and you're over 65, you could run, I think, about four hours, a little over four hours maybe, and get in. But you're over 65. So it's, it's a really, really good performance. Uh, all these performances are age graded down. Uh, especially, you know, in the low three-hour ranges for most people uh, in their uh, 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, it's it's a very uh, stringent goal, and it's a time goal that people chase for years uh, to get in a, a lifetime accomplishment if, if you get in. So really a special thing there, and I think some of you guys maybe could relate to that in my quest, my personal quest of trying to qualify for a U.S. Olympic Trials Marathon, uh, it's the same type of thing. You're chasing a, a time goal where you really have to push yourself and you have you can only do it on qualified courses in certain races and you know sometimes the weather's crappy and you, you don't train right and things fall apart and you miss it by a minute or you're you know two seconds a mile off and you know I've, I've been there too so Boston qualifying, Olympic Trials qualifying, trying to get your personal best in a marathon uh, it takes years and years of dedication and sacrifice for a lot of people. And depending on your talent level, uh, you know, some people could do it maybe off of less training than others, but a lot of people are going to really have to maximize their marathon training. And that's what this talk is really about, uh, is how to optimize your training to go after that BQ if you're getting close. Now, the first thing I'll say is go to our website, sagerunning.com, and check out our BQ plan. No, not really, but yeah, really, at the end of this talk, you could check it out. Uh, we do have a plan specifically designed for those trying to qualify for Boston. And usually it's it's targeted for people that have already been within 10 or 15 minutes of the standard. Because uh, if you're in that range, you could definitely you know pop a big one and get a 10 minute PR uh, sometimes depending on how long you've been training and what your weekly mileage is. Now, the first note on Boston Marathon training is weekly mileage. Uh, usually people aren't gonna be able to qualify for Boston based, you know, running 20 or 30 miles a week, uh, you're gonna have to make in a much more concerted effort. Um, a lot of people, I know people, uh, people that work, you know, full-time jobs that'll sacrifice a ton and, and train maybe up to 90 or 100 miles a week uh, to get their BQ. Um, and it, it, I'm not saying it necessarily will take that kind of mileage. Uh, our Boston Marathon uh, BQ plan, marathon training plan, goes up to a high of 65 or 75 miles per week uh, as a top end there. But again, it, depending on your talent level, unless you're a really, really talented runner, you're probably not gonna be able to run 
close to your best performance of a marathon or under a BQ time unless you're running at least 40 or 50 miles a week. Uh, my brother just got a, a BQ and he's a very talented runner, but he didn't run for years and he got up to, he still had to get up to 40 or 50 miles a week uh, to crack three hours in the marathon. Um, and so for many people though, it's gonna take years and years and months even to get up to that kind of volume of mileage. So mileage is really the first component uh, that separates you from uh, you know, trying to finish a marathon to actually trying to really improve to reach your full potential in the marathon and to maybe even eventually chase after a BQ time. And generally, higher is better as long as you don't get injured. Uh, if you have the time and energy and, and resources for it, I'd say go for it, but you can't get injured. And so you do have to be cautious with that. And generally, you see the people at Boston usually are running at least 50, 60, sometimes over 70 miles a week or more. Uh, to, to push their body to get to that time. And it, it goes back to how many years you've been running, what your training age is. Um, you know, it takes years and years of this aerobic base building and, and steady, consistent mileage over months and months and years and years to really build up. And when you tow the starting line in a marathon, it's really how many years have you been, how many thousands of miles have you, lifetime miles have you accumulated and how many years have you really put into the sport. Now. We have the mileage component, but now we'll look at factors of basic speed. Now, with training, you know, I, I refer to uh, Jack Daniels a lot. Sandy and I really like his coaching philosophy, and we read a lot of books on distance running training. And he has a V dot table uh, in his book, which is essentially kind of like a race calculator. It equivalates um, race performances over different distances uh, from a mile all the way up to a marathon and every distance in between. So. You have to be careful with race calculators and equivalency tables because people say, whoa, I run a, you know, an 18 minute 5K, I should be able to go sub three in the marathon easily. Doesn't always, doesn't usually work like that. You'd have to train specifically for the marathon and be very talented at the marathon with a, a big mileage base to be able to pull off a sub three off of uh, 18 minute 5K speed, which is a time that uh, a lot of high school cross country runners could run, but they're not gonna run a marathon, of course. So you'd have to take it with a grain of salt, but it gives you rough indicators of the bare minimum requirement uh, to, to run a certain time in the marathon. So for example, we'll go with the fast end of the spectrum, the three hour barrier, three hour marathon. And I've done a talk on training for a sub three before. Uh, you can check that out on my channel as well. But uh, if you're going after a three, three hour marathon, Obviously, you need your half marathon pace to be faster than that. And if it's not already, I'd suggest probably working on that first uh, to some degree. Because um, if you're not running, if you're PR in the half marathon, and this goes with Jack Daniels' table, uh, right in between about a 126 half marathon, uh, is that's kind of the bare minimum of half marathon speed you need for sub three. Now, uh, it kind of fits into the formula of add five minutes to your half marathon time and then double it uh, for your full marathon, or just double your half marathon time, add 10 minutes. Well, this is about four minutes. Uh, for people down in my time range, uh, for me, it's it's more like double your half and add three minutes, but you have to understand that when you're in the low two hour ranges, every minute, every second is kind of worth a lot more proportionately than if you're in the three or four hour uh, marathon range. But for a lot of people, that's a, a good rough starting point, and a lot of people, Generally, I mean, you could run a 120 half marathon and then maybe fail to put two 130 half marathons back to back. That happens all the time because people don't train specifically for the marathon event. They, they don't. They treat it like a half marathon. The marathon's a totally different beast. So uh, bare minimum speed, and this is if you're more like a marathon specialist or even ultra runner, you know, 127, 126. If you can't run that for the half, it's going to be really hard to run to sub 130 half marathons back to back. Uh, and likewise, it goes with the 10K speed. Uh, you need sub about sub 39 minute 10K speed. And to do that, how do you run a sub 39 minute 10K? Well, you better be running the sub 19 uh, 5K. And so it kind of goes all the way down from there. Now, I'm not a miler, I'm not a sprinter. I don't have the fast leg speed even at 5K or 10K, but I've run fast enough in the half marathon to ensure that I have a little bit of a buffer uh, when I try to go after my personal best in the marathon. And uh, it's a good way to kind of get an idea of what kind of speed you need to be attaining, at least in the half marathon, to, to be able to do that kind of conversion. And that's really the next kind of takeaway is 
what training do you need to do to improve yourself to be able to sustain more of your speed, a higher percentage of your speed at the shorter distances and kind of translate that into a time that's gonna be really competitive and a big personal best for you in the full marathon. So you got the mileage component, uh, your history and running, and then this, these speed requirements. How do you, what workouts do you need to do to really transition into that? Well, this could be a really, really long talk. It's already getting long, but uh, generally, and as you, you see this in all of our sagerunning.com plans, but also in my philosophy preached through all these training talks over the years, we got uh, a lot of videos out here on YouTube now, but you're gonna need a good mix of workouts and all great marathon plans have these mixes of workouts. And it's really about getting in the right mix of speed, the right intensity on long runs, duration of long runs, and recovering and absorbing that training. So you have the strength to, to go the full 26.2 miles at a faster pace. And, you know, key workouts, if you look at key indicator types of workouts, and these, you know, are gonna rotate depending on each training week, but things that have really helped would be things like two mile repeats. And actually, first, before I get into some specific workouts, and I'm not gonna cover them all because it would be too long of a talk, uh, and it would give away our sage running plan, not really, but uh, think of it in terms of a five pace five paces. Um, and in the middle, I'm not going to flick you off here, but in the middle, let's pretend this is marathon race pace. And let's pretend that off on this side, uh, these guys are slower than marathon pace. And then off on this side, these guys are faster than marathon race pace. So you got marathon race pace in the middle. Here, I'm going to make a little sticky note on there so it's easier to see. And I'm so I'm not flicking you guys off. Uh, all right, so this is marathon pace. This is not working well. There. So marathon pace in the middle, slower, faster. So you've got these five notches of paces and it's kind of an oversimplification, but uh, generally that's kind of what you wanna be working with. Now on the slowest end of the spectrum, we have our easy recovery jog type of pace, right? It's, it's super slow, super relaxed. Now maybe on this next notch, we have a more intense type of long run pace where we kind of throw down uh, we might even call it an up-tempo pace. That's what we call it on our sagerunning.com pace intensity spectrum, which I suggest you check out after watching this video. Uh, then you have marathon pace, which is very close to that, and could there could be some overlap here. Um, then working down higher intensity speed below marathon pace, and faster than marathon pace, uh, we're at this finger here. This is not a good way to do things, but uh, this is lactate threshold tempo run pace, and it's a notch faster than marathon pace. It might be closer to your 10K pace, it might be closer to half marathon pace, depending on what time range you're in and depending on the workout, but that's gonna be that intensity. And then this intensity, the fastest end of the spectrum for general marathon training is gonna be the VO2 max, which is more like 5K type of race pace. Now we could go even farther, we could go to strides and sprinting speed, but that's the general five pace type of theory um, that coaches have preached over decades. It's not a Sage original, sorry guys, but uh, that's kind of an oversimplification of things, but that's kind of illustrating the point that you need speed training to run such an endurance event. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that intensity at some level does lead to success. Now, if you're doing a bunch of 400 meter repeats out on the track, that's not very specific. Even Yazo 800s, it's not super specific to marathon training unless you're backing it up with some really good quality long runs in some longer types of lactate threshold or tempo run types of efforts, or even racing a half marathon as part of your buildup into a full marathon. Always a good indicator. Not necessarily the best way to get a half marathon PR, but a lot of times it does work uh, in that way and you get really fit doing marathon training in general. But if you're super dialed for the marathon, it doesn't mean you're gonna be super speedy at 5K and 10K, and you might miss your half marathon PR because you're doing high mileage during that half marathon uh, race that you do during your marathon buildup, which you probably should be doing. Uh, Cause high mileage does tire the legs out. It calluses the legs though. And so when you do workouts in a marathon training program uh, to get faster, let's say you're doing, you do things like two mile repeats to work on your tempo and lactic threshold pace. And let's say you do them at a estimated 10K race pace. And maybe you're using a calculator to kind of rough, roughly estimate what your 10K pace is, or you know what your, your 10K PR pace is, uh, what is your current 10K PR, or what, what could you do for a 10K in your marathon training? That's really the question. So 
if you have a rough indicator of what kind of pace that is and what kind of heart rate you, you operate around at that pace, you know kind of what to do your two mile repeats at. And uh, again, we spell this out all in our programs, but uh, this is kind of an oversimplification. You're gonna need workouts like that, two mile repeats. You're gonna need workouts like three mile repeats <clears throat> or three by 5K uh, is what I like to do, two to three by 5K. You're gonna need some long runs. Yeah, generally, most marathoners are always gonna be running long runs, 18, 20, maybe even 22 miles in length, uh, really spending a lot of time on your feet. And a rough indicator of intensity for those long runs is how close did you get to marathon pace maybe for a good six miles in there at the end? Uh, did you throw down the second half of that long run and surge faster than, than marathon pace for some of those miles? And what was your average pace per mile uh, during that whole long run, was it within 40 or 30 seconds per mile of what you want to accomplish on race day? Now, if you're a real beginner with marathon running and you're doing maybe a 14, 15 mile long run, uh, a lot of times uh, people, beginners maybe in slower time ranges, could easily run that whole long run at their marathon pace or even faster. Um, but it's not always a good indicator of what you could hold after 20 miles. Because uh, the, the second half of the marathon, the last 10K of a marathon, so to speak, is this important second half, halfway being the 20 mile mark, because uh, it's that important. You hit the wall, things go exponentially bad or exponentially good, and that really makes or breaks your race. And so we look at it in terms of long run intensity, to look at it in terms of lactate threshold, a good mix of the lactate threshold, two and three mile repeats essentially. And then we look at getting in some leg turnover types of workouts where you're doing track sessions, you're doing intervals on a track, uh, at more like 5k to 10k pace and so you're doing these speed intervals and you're knowing that with that example of the three-hour marathoner uh, you know your 10k pace is 38 minutes 39 minutes for a 10k and you're doing repeat kilometers or repeat uh, miles kind of at that pace or even a little faster and it could be anywhere between 20 seconds to you know 30 seconds per mile faster than your goal marathon pace and that's kind of a real feasible uh, type of speed stimulus in that sort of time range. Uh, goal marathon pace for the three hour marathon are being 651 to 652 uh, per mile pace. And so that's kind of just a rough, rough scratching the surface type of uh, training talk for what it takes to qualify for Boston, but it takes a lot of hard work, guts, blood, sweat, and tears. Basically a lot of sacrifice, uh, especially for people with full-time jobs and maybe a family and uh, you know, balancing all sorts of things, but it's a real noble goal. And it's something that all of us that run race marathons who want to improve our times uh, could, could learn something from. And the whole process of chasing that standard when it's right there uh, is, is really a great thing. And people get uh, a great experience at the Boston Marathon. I've always enjoyed my time there, even though the first time I ran Boston, the race went really bad. Um, but it's it's a great atmosphere and a great race to be a part of. Um, same thing with New York and, and uh, Chicago too. I like those a lot in any race actually. But uh, the idea of improving yourself as a runner um, with the higher mileage training, with having a set training schedule where you know you're doing a good mix of workouts, including speed, shorter workouts, uh, lactate threshold workouts, and workouts that revolve around goal pace and uh, your current fitness, as your current fitness hopefully progresses and increases throughout the training cycle. Um, and our, you know, our plans differ in length, but usually this is a nice 16 week type of build up plan. Some people might think that's really short, but again, if you've been running for months and months and you have a couple weeks at least, or maybe a month of easy mileage running, ascending to 40 or 50 miles a week, built up already, then you could jump into these workouts, uh, especially if you have years of experience and previous marathon finishes. Whereas if you're a true beginner, you're probably not gonna wanna do that quite yet. Um, but that's kind of the gist of, of uh, what it takes to BQ. Uh, you can check out our Sage Running Marathon BQ Marathon Training Plan on our website, sagerunning.com. Uh, definitely check out the pace intensity spectrum chart. I'll kind of do a little graphic of it right here so you can kind of get an idea of what I'm, what I'm talking about. It is available on our website, sagerunning.com. Uh, it's a very obvious coaching plug right there, but really do appreciate all the support, all the views, all the comments. Uh, be sure to vote for future training talk topics as well as subscribe for the newest videos and uh, really do appreciate sharing this on social media. And, uh, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. I'm at Sage Canada on both those uh, channels. 
as well as on Facebook Sage Canada fan page. Again, I really appreciate all the support and feedback. I hope your late fall, early winter type of training is going well. It's getting cold here in Boulder. And I wish you the best of luck uh, with your future races or future events. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more VO2 Max Productions. Thank you.